Welcome everyone to the next topic in module 9. Uh, what are xenobiotics is our first subtopic. We'll look at what these compounds are and where they come from and why they are persistent. Why do they bioaccumulate in the environment? These are some of the things that we're going to look at in part 1. So let's come to the definition of xenobiotics. What are xenobiotics? These Xeno means alien or foreign. So any organic compound that is made in the lab or in whether it's an industry lab or a research lab, it doesn't matter. Synthetic organic compounds that are manufactured, that are anthropogenic in nature are therefore by definition alien or foreign to the environment. And this has an impact on the biota of the environment where these synthetic organic compounds are released. So we know that examples include herbicides, pesticides, some of the polychlorinated biphenyls, uh, chlorinated solvents. All of these are examples of synthetic organic chemicals that are constantly being released into the environment. So many of them are hazardous as well as toxic. And any chemical that is toxic to either higher or lower organisms. It, it goes without saying that if you are using a pesticide, it's going to be toxic, yes, to the pest that you're trying to eliminate, but there will be some impact on higher organisms as well. Um, I would like to mention one little point over here, and that is that the toxicity is related to the body weight. So the smaller, let's say the same, let's say you have two organisms, one has a very high body weight and the other has a very small body weight. So let's say you're dealing with a mosquito or a cockroach or some other pest like that and you're comparing yourself and your exposure to the same chemical and the same concentration. So because of the higher body weight, we are actually taking in a dose that's far smaller in amount compared to the a smaller organism and that's why the toxicity to the smaller organisms is visually evident to all of us but for the higher organisms like human beings and other animals the toxicity is apparent only over long term or short term exposure depending on the concentration that they are exposed to so the when a chemical is toxic it's likely to be toxic to both higher as well as lower organisms what matters is the dose, which I do not have time to go into at this point, but that's a very important part of exposure to um, xenobiotics. It's a source of pollution problems. Today we are worried about the pesticides in water, we are worried about uh, many of these compounds of synthetic uh, nature that are now part of the streams and lakes and so on and therefore they become part of our drinking water and many other uh, problems are associated with them. They can have short term and long term health effects not just on us but on other species and that depends on their concentration and routes of exposure. What is the reason for all these problems? The biggest reason for these problems is that these are new to the environment which means that the microbial uh, flora in a particular area that is already existing in that area is not adapted to the presence of these alien chemicals. So in a sense many of these chemicals are recalcitrant or persistent and they do not degrade easily. They can be degraded by physical, chemical and biological reactions. The biological reactions are a little more difficult compared to the physical and chemical reactions. And I can spend a lot of time on this, but I have um, limited the scope of this lecture to certain ideas. So um, there's a lot more to this topic, but I won't be able to address all of it. I'm spending just about an hour on it and uh, if there is interest we can think about something else. So let's come to the idea of pesticides. We're all concerned. We know every, I think even little kids who go to school have been told that pesticides can be toxic, they can be hazardous, uh, you should not uh, let them go into your mouth, into your eyes, all of these things I think are well known. These 
SOCs or synthetic organic compounds were designed to be persistent. So let's say in the 1950s when it became big to uh, manufacture all these compounds, um, the idea that a compound will uh, last for the entire plant growing season, remember that most of the pesticides are used by farmers in their agriculture. And the idea of using a particular chemical, allowing it to be in the field and it would remain there for at least the one growing season was a good idea. It sounded like a good idea. Until in the 50s, 60s, 70s, it became more and more apparent that these pesticides were bioaccumulating in the tissue of human beings as well as animals and birds. And DDT is one of the best documented examples of a pesticide that bioaccumulates. Many other compounds, not just DDT, but many other pesticidal compounds have mutagenic and carcinogenic potential, which became obvious, like I said, through the 50s, 60s, 70s, and people are still working on these uh, compounds. Once it was recognized that these compounds are uh, likely to cause long-term health effects, it has now become necessary for pesticide manufacturing companies to prove that whatever they are manufacturing and selling will degrade as rapidly in the environment as possible. Now, what does this all have to do with microbiology? Remember, the whole idea starts with this point. These are alien to the biota of the environment. So, if we have uh, microbes that can be acclimated to degrading these kinds of compounds, then we can solve the problem with relative ease. Let me, uh, before I go into all the details, let me give you an example of bioaccumulation and what it is related to. Um, <clears throat> so here on this graph, you see two factors. On the x-axis, you have log n-octanol divided by water partitioning coefficient. That's log KOW. It's KOW stands for the octanol water partitioning coefficient. So you have C n octanol divided by C water. Now um, C stands for concentration in octanol versus concentration in water. Now if a compound is hydrophobic, it will prefer to be dissolved in octanol and not in water. If it's hydrophilic, the concentration in water will be higher than in octanol. So let me just show you a few examples of that. So here we have let's say phenol. Let's take phenol. It's something that we see around us in our environment. It's called carbolic acid. If you go to the uh, shop and ask for carbolic acid, they'll give you phenol. So this is the aqueous solubility. It's highly soluble. It has a low KOW. It's uh, very close to 1. And the, the last column is Henry's constant. Let's take DDT. Look at the water solubility of DDT. It's 5.5 micrograms per liter. So it's not very soluble in water. It's a well-known hydrophobic compound and the log KOW value is extremely high. 6.9. Okay. So 10 to the power close to 7 is how much of DDT will dissolve in octanol compared to water. So this is the log octanol water partitioning coefficient and on the y-axis we have the log bioaccumulation factor. This is a set of data from a particular paper where the water partitioning coefficient and the bioaccumulation of various chemicals, I think there are 41 different chemicals that have been tested using one particular species of algae chlorella. Okay, so this chlorella species, which is an algal species, has been exposed to 41 different chemicals and these are the bioaccumulants. Now, when you add a particular chemical to water and then you try to grow a particular species, whether it's algae, whether it's bacteria, whatever it may be, you can harvest those cells and then determine how much of that chemical is still present in the tissue of those cells. 
okay and that is i think what they have done here and this is a clear and simple correlation so we have kow which is a chemical factor it has nothing to do with biology and then we have the bio concentration or the bioaccumulation factor which is clearly correlated to the chemical factor so this is the best evidence we have and there are several papers and this is one of the earlier papers it's 1984 so as far back as that and there are many studies this is just an example but there are thousands of papers out there that will give you similar data my point here is that you have a clear correlation between the chemical uh, factor which is kow and the bioaccumulation factor now chemical factors are much easier to determine or you can just open a reference book and look at the chemical factor right and knowing this kind of relationship exists you know that there is a high potential for bioaccumulation of these compounds based on their kow values so when you have a high log kow value it means that compound is going to bioaccumulate in human as well as the tissue of other higher organisms so there is a certain health impact associated with these chemicals which can be readily uh, looked at knowing these um, ideas knowing these concepts what is the bio uh, concentration factor or the bioaccumulation factor the concentration in the biota of a particular organism divided by the concentration in water so that's about xenobiotics so that is a characteristic of xenobiotics that they are difficult to biodegrade one because they are hydrophobic remember most biological organisms most microbes live in water they want water so if something is hydrophobic it becomes difficult to biodegrade that's one reason second reason is uh, that these are uh, chemically stable compounds they're very persistent they're very recalcitrant and i'll come to more details about this in the next few slides so if i want to use my knowledge of bi uh, microbiology for the bioremediation of xenobiotics can it be done and the answer is yes uh, it's cheap and effective so we have xenobiotic compounds like pesticides polychlorinated biphenyls chlorinated solvents they're all hazardous and toxic and we can remediate areas that let's say you have large areas that have been contaminated by these synthetic organic compounds is it possible to use biological processes to clean up the mess and the answer is yes so they are cheap they are effective methods for remediating either accidental releases or sustained releases of these xenobiotics in the environment it can be done under aerobic conditions as well as anaerobic conditions you might be wondering how that is possible um, because when i say xenobiotics it means that you need microbial biota to be acclimated to the presence of these compounds and once you can acclimate them and find out if they have any particular nutrient requirement and so on or what is missing in the environment then you can design your bioremediation strategies so you can use microbes to degrade these xenobiotics the biodegradation can go to it can go the full length which means to the end point harmless end products like carbon dioxide and water or in many cases what does happen if you leave nature to itself what you get is toxic intermediate pro uh, products so ddt when it was sprayed in the fields resulted in compounds like ddd and dde and ddd and dde are considered to be more toxic than the parent compound the parent compound is toxic but the intermediates are even more toxic so these are some of the problems associated with leaving nature to itself so remember we are introducing something into nature that doesn't belong over there and therefore it creates a bigger problem so what do you need for bioremediation you need acclimated microbial communities you can have pure species which means single species or you can have consortia and then you need adequate nutrient supply okay so uh, having talked about bioconcentration and bioaccumulation i'd like to add some definitions here 
what is a bioconcentration factor? The bioconcentration factor uh, has been defined as the concentration of a compound in comparison to that in water. So the medium um, in comparison can be the tissue of any organism or any other material. So in an equation form that would be the concentration in the biota divided by the concentration in water. Then we have another word which is very common and that is bioaccumulation factor. This is the increase in the concentration of a compound in the tissue of an organism over a specified period of exposure. So if a, if a particular organism has been exposed to a particular compound for either months or years and so on, then it is accumulating that compound in its tissue and therefore it's a function of Time. So that is bioaccumulation factor. And the last one is biomagnification factor. Biomagnification factor uh, tells us about the increase in concentration of any compound as it goes up the food pyramid. So assuming that water is below the lowest level, below the lowest trophic level, whatever concentration there is in the water will get um, that will increase in the tissue of the phytoplankton plankton which are at the bottom of the pyramid and from the phytoplankton right up to the top of the pyramid you will get increased concentration of the compound in the tissue of the organisms. Uh, before I go into further details let me uh, define a few terms that are commonly used in the literature regarding uh, biodegradation of xenobiotics. So the first term that is very common is recalcitrance. So when I say a particular compound is recalcitrant, it means the chemical is resistant to biodegradation under all conditions. No microbe will grow over it, uh, grow on it and under no uh, growth conditions. No matter what environmental conditions you provide, no microbe will be able to grow. Now, true recalcitrance has never been observed. It's not possible. I already said it in my first lecture. There is this concept of bacterial infallibility. That means if you provide sufficient conditions, sufficient time for the microbial community to acclimate itself, they'll find a way to degrade it. Okay. So that is part of bacterial infallibility. They can never be wrong. They are always uh, capable of adapting themselves to new environmental conditions including the presence of a new chemical. Persistence is very common when we look at DDT, when we look at phenol or lindane or um, any of the uh, endosulfan, there are so many pesticides out there. When we look at these compounds and we find that they have half-lives that are more than a year Okay, so that means that these chemicals are resistant to biodegradation under certain environmental conditions. So there are a, there's a long list of compounds which are considered to be uh, persistent. Then we use another term called mineralization. Mineralization is when the organic compound is converted under aerobic conditions to inorganic products like CO2, water, ammonia, sul uh, sulfuric acid, hydrogen sulfide, chloride and the list goes on. That is what we want. Ideally, we want an organic compound to be converted to these harmless end products. Okay, but it's not that easy. We don't always get complete oxidation of the organic compound to these harmless end products. The last one is biotransformation. Biotransformation means the organic. Now, uh, I will also mention here something that's not mentioned on the slide. You have the use of the word biotransformation has been applied to both organic compounds as well as to uh, metals, heavy metals. Now, let's go through organic compounds before I uh, uh, talk about heavy metals. So here we have organic compounds that are not completely oxidized to CO2. So if I want complete oxidation, the organic compound has to be converted to CO2. If it is partially converted, like I said, DDT going to DDD or DDE, that's partial oxidation to other organic compounds, whether it's aerobic or anaerobic. That is possible. So we call that biotransformation or biodegradation, but it's not mineralization. 
okay so that's one major point the second issue that we have is that heavy metals can be uh, can be utilized by microbes they can be biotransformed they can never be biodegraded a heavy metal will remain a heavy metal you can't change its nature so it can be biotransformed because you're changing the oxidation state you may be creating organol uh, metal uh, complexes all those kinds of things are possible but you cannot biodegrade a metal you can only biotransform a metal so uh, let's come to the next point and um, knowing what you know about the sequence of electron acceptors so i've shown you in the previous few slides and in the last lecture i've shown you the different terminal electron acceptors that may be present in the environment and they can pair up with electron donors that are either utilizing organic carbon or they are utilizing inorganic donors electron donors now here we have an interesting uh, situation so you may have let us say i always talk about um, leaking underground storage tanks which contain petroleum products so next time you go to a petrol pump just look around where the petrol is being stored in general most petrol pumps have underground storage tanks so these storage tanks over a long period of time will probably find uh, start leaking at some point if the groundwater table is fairly close to the bottom of the leaking tank in the area that i am in in west bengal the water table is often at the surface during the monsoon season and it drops about 6 to 10 feet after that so here the water table is very high and when the water table is very high uh, these leaking underground storage tanks will impact they will contaminate the water the groundwater in this area so here you have the leakage of a chemical from an underground storage tank it's leaking into the subsurface it will flow along with the water these chemicals will flow along with the water and you will get a contaminant plume now the subsurface it's not visible to the eye but it's not dead it's not sterile there are microbes that live in the subsurface now what are they going to do when they are exposed to these compounds whether they are of petroleum whether they are petroleum compounds whether they are um, you know from an industrial site so you may have an industrial site where they are manufacturing certain chemicals and if they are dumping the chemicals on the site on the land or in the uh, neighboring areas and streams and so on all these compounds will end up either in the subsurface or on the or in the surface water bodies so here we are looking at subsurface contamination by different chemicals i've already shown you the sequence of electron acceptors uh, so here we have oxygen denitrification where nitrate is converted to nitrogen gas mn4 fe3 the, these are reduced then you have sulfate reduction and you have methanogenesis what i want to show you over here is that as long as oxygen is available remember our electron tower the best electron acceptor the best terminal electron acceptor is oxygen so the bacteria as long as there is oxygen will utilize some of the organic compounds that are present in groundwater and along with oxygen and you can see the oxygen level going down ammonia if it is present will also go down it will if oxygen is present ammonia will be converted to nitrite and nitrate you will get an increase in nitrate because nitrate is part of the end let me see if i can write that so okay so this is the conversion if there is ammonia to begin with this ammonia will be converted to nitrite and nitrate so what you see over here is reduction in ammonia 
and increase in nitrate concentration. Now this nitrate can serve as a terminal electron acceptor in these denitrification reactions. Then you have Mn4 and Fe3. They can serve as terminal electron acceptors and you can see that Fe2 plus concentration here is the Fe2 plus yeah, and Mn2 plus is going up as Mn4 is being converted to Mn2 and Fe3 is being converted to Fe2. So these are studies and this is again a fairly old paper and um, uh, these uh, studies have been published and it's been shown that these particular compounds that are listed under each terminal electron acceptor that they have been degraded with this combination. So you have these compounds as the electron donors and the various electron acceptors are listed at the top. Um, novel biotransformations. So when we talk about synthetic organic compounds, we have novel biotransformations and novel in the sense that they are new, new for the environment. So there can be two possibilities that the organic compound can serve as the primary substrate. If it is the primary substrate, the organic compound serves as an energy or carbon source. And if it is a secondary substrate, the microbes are not going to get either carbon or energy from this particular compound. But what they will do is that because the enzymes for utilizing the primary substrate are already there, so there is an automatic conversion, a natural conversion of the secondary substrate, even though it serves no real purpose for the bacteria. And the electron acceptor is the compound that is transformed and serves as the energy source. So there are three types of secondary utilization. First is co-metabolism. Co-metabolism is when the secondary substrate is used along with the primary substrate. So you can have DDT, TCE, trichloroethylene and polychlorinated biphenyls. Um, these are, before I come to that example, this is a list of several uh, terminal electron acceptors that are kind of um, novel in that sense. So you have chlorate. Chlorate is not something you're going to see in the environment. It's formed when you add chlorine to drinking water. Then you have manganic iron. So you have Mn4 plus being reduced to Mn2 plus. Selenate, which is um, selenium 6 that is being reduced to selenite. Fe3 being reduced to Fe2. DMSO. DMSO is a a compound that is often um, found in water, especially seawater and so on, and TMA, uh, TMAO as well. And then you have arsenate. Arsenate 5 is being reduced to arsenate 3 and fumarate and succinate. So these are some, uh, I don't want to call them novel electron acceptors, but that's the wrong word. But these are very different. They are not the usual electron acceptors. Then we come to the next one. Now, um, petroleum compounds contain benzene, toluene, uh, phenol, xylene, and so many ethyl benzene. All these are uh, compounds that are present in petroleum, uh, the petrol that you buy when you go to the petrol pump. So here you have compounds like benzene, toluene, phenol, chlorobenzene, nitrotoluene. These are uh, compounds that are known to serve as primary substrates. So what I want to show you here is that let's say you have toluene in the presence of oxygen, one particular enzyme called toluene dioxygenase is capable of converting this very stable aromatic ring to cis-toluene dihydrodiol. So the first thing I want to say is that it's very difficult to break an aromatic ring. So any aromatic compound is much more difficult to biodegrade compared to an aliphatic compound. So when you have aromatic compounds like polychlorinated biphenyls, DDT, naphthalene, phenol, toluene, all these, on a relative scale, they are difficult to biodegrade. So the first step 
itself is quite difficult so toluene dioxygenase is doing that it is converting it to a dihydrodiol which is easier to biodegrade it. that will break the ring and allow biodegradation to happen once this enzyme is there in the system and if you have trichloroethylene this trichloroethylene in the presence of oxygen and in the presence of this enzyme is going to be converted to TCE epoxide. Now, I think there are two uh, references here. One says it's COC. Uh, this, uh, this double bond is converted to a single bond or there are COOC. So, in either case, this compound I think is easier to biodegrade compared to the first one. So, having gone through this first step, it becomes easier. Um, now, here is another very important point. No matter uh, what the SOC is, whether it's of uh, whether it's of anthropogenic origin or whether it's in petrol or in any other mixture of industrial chemicals, whatever it is, uh, if you know the chemical formula for a compound, you can use that information to determine the free energy of formation and then come up with half reactions as shown in that table, table 6.4. You can create those half reactions on your own based on your understanding of thermodynamics and what we have gone through. So, once you know your electron acceptor, once you know the free energy of formation of your SOC, you can write the half reactions, make oxidation reduction reactions and then answer the question, is it thermodynamically favorable for this compound to be uh, utilized as a primary substrate by bacteria? Once the answer is thermodynamically favorable, yes, then it's worth trying experimentally. But if the answer is no, thermodynamically it's not favorable, then it's unlikely that there will be any bacterial species that can survive under those conditions. Okay? So, that's just one way of utilizing this information. So, that was one example that I showed you. The SOC can serve as an electron acceptor and it will be reduced in the process while the uh, primary substrate is oxidized. If the concentration is too low, the microbes will utilize it maybe as a primary substrate, but it's going to be called a secondary substrate because they're not really utilizing it for creating biomass and energy. So, it will get utilized, but as a secondary substrate. What are the factors that influence uh, xenobiotic biodegradability? The first thing is the molecular structure. So, if you have a straight chain aliphatic compound, compared to a branch chain aliphatic. Remember I showed you examples of starch, cellulose and um, glycogen. Starch and cellulose are straight chain uh, aliphatics and they are much easier to degrade. Starch is the easiest, cellulose slightly more difficult and the branch chain compound even more difficult. Functional groups under aerobic conditions, uh, you have these ring structure. So, you have benzene, you have toluene, xylene, ethyl benzene. So, it's been known that uh, metaxylene is more degradable compared to toluene, more degradable compared to benzene and ethyl benzene is the least degradable. So, it all depends on the nature of the functional group that is attached to the aromatic ring. I have not mentioned anything about aromatics here, but aromatic compounds benzene based compounds whether they are one ring or more than one ring like naphthalene which has two rings aromatic compounds are considered to be more difficult to biodegrade compared to aliphatics within aliphatics again degree of saturation at some point in the past i've also mentioned that saturated aliphatics are more difficult to biodegrade compared to unsaturated aliphatics um, I'm not going to go into any details, you can go through the literature and then saturated aliphatics in general are more difficult to de degrade compared to unsaturated aliphatics. I've already mentioned degree of branching, the greater the degree of branching, the more difficult it is to degrade. Aqueous solubility is a huge factor. If it's hydrophobic compound, it's very difficult to biodegrade. If it's hydrophilic, it's going to remain in solution and therefore it's easier to degrade. 
and then charge effects. So depending on the charge carried by the compound, let's say at pH 7, and uh, if those are the conditions under which it has, let's say a negative charge, the cell is negatively charged and the outer surface of the cell is generally considered to be negatively charged. But um, so if you have a negatively charged compound, it may be difficult to degrade it depending on the other environmental conditions and vice versa. So that's it. Let's come to some more generalizations. Simple carbohydrates and amino acids are highly biodegradable. So we all know that if you add sugar to water and put in some bacteria as well, they will have a great time because these sugars are highly biodegradable. You, if you want proof, take some fruit sugar, leave it and it will pick up some microbes from the air and they will start degrading. It becomes a real mess. It will start stinking very easily. Fats and oils are harder to degrade because of their low aqueous solubility. Straight chain saturated aliphatics can be biodegraded aerobically but not anaerobically. The first step in the beta oxidation pathway requires oxygen and the second step uh, can be it can be uh, done under both aerobic as well as anaerobic conditions. Unsaturated aliphatics can be degraded both under aerobic as well as anaerobic conditions. I've already mentioned all of this, straight chain is easier than branched, alcohols and acids easier than aldehydes, easier than ketones and hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are what you see in petrol. Primary and secondary carbon and nitrogen is easier to degrade than tertiary or quaternary carbon and nitrogen. Aromatics greater than halogenated aromatics or nitrate containing aromatics. Ortho and para ring positions are easier to degrade than meta ring positions on the benzene ring. As the number of rings increases, resistance to biodegradation increases. Simplest example, benzene versus naphthalene. Naphthalene has two rings, benzene has one ring. Naphthalene is much harder to degrade compared to benzene. And then polymeric compounds. Uh, thank you for your attention and we will continue with this particular topic in the next lecture. Thank you.